so honored today that we have such an esteemed guest as a scientist, a professor, uh, an animal behaviorist, but most passionately for me as an educator, um, Temple Grandin is a spokesperson, an activist, and an ally for those on the autism spectrum. And so throughout this wonderful interview, we're going to learn um, some personal anecdotes about Temple, but she's also going to share her life in the field of, of the things that she's been able to do that have truly changed the world. She's about getting things done. So Temple, let's let's start there. You like to get things done. You don't want to pontificate. You want to get things done. And, and where does that, that ability to make change come from? Well, I'm an extreme visual thinker. And I think that might have something to do with it because everything I think about is a picture. So let's just think of something simple like driving to the airport. I always leave an extra hour because I'm visualizing, well, maybe there'll be a traffic jam out on the freeway or something like that. Um, And now I'm seeing this truck that spilled all these boxes all over the freeway. That was an hour tie up. You see, those things are, are not, abstract and and there's different kinds of thinking i'm what's called an object visualizer and i first talked about this in my book thinking in pictures before i learned exactly what an object visualizer was um it's a person that thinks completely in pictures and that is how i think i described that in my book thinking in pictures and i discovered when i was in my mid-30s that um most people think more in words. They don't think in pictures. Now, when I write, I see the pictures of the things I'm going to write. You've got the object visualizers like me, and then you've got the mathematical pattern thinkers, uh, where they think more in patterns and think music and math. Those are going to be your computer programs. Um, But I like to get things done. I like real stuff that's not abstract. Because what I've learned about verbal thinking, there's a tendency to have an abstract policy or something like that. But they don't think about how do I actually implement that policy? Okay, like having an inclusive classroom. Well, I'm going to see that as specifics. Here's a situation where it worked. Here's a situation where it did not work. What are the common denominators of the situations that really worked? First of all, you've got to have a teacher and a principal that are behind it. I've learned that with my cattle handling work. You've got to have the management of the ranch, the feed yard, the meat plant, whatever it is, has to be behind having and support, having good you know, animal handling practices. Temple, I appreciate how your practical experience is a part of how you process and you learn and ultimately practice. But I'd love for you to talk about those early years. I understand that until you were about three or four years old, you were nonverbal. So can you tell our audience about those early years before you were speaking? I can remember the frustration of not being able to have talk. Very, very frustrating. Did not have full speech till four. And when the grown-ups talked really fast, I just wanted to gibberish. But I got into very good speech therapy by age two and a half. <coughs> the other thing that was done with me when I was um, started to show art ability as a visual thinker around second and third grade, my mother, my mother always encouraged it. Take the thing the kid's good at, build on it. Another kid, it might be math. Another kid, it might be writing. Those are the kids that love history. See, kids that are on the autism spectrum are often really good at one thing and really bad at something else. That's the way it kind of works. And mother built on my strengths. But I would just draw the same horse head over and over again. And she'd say, well, why don't you draw the stable or draw the saddle or draw the entire horse? You want to broaden it. The other big thing that gets mixed up is the difference between an interest, that'd be dogs or horses or cars, for example, and a skill like drawing, mechanical ability, mathematical ability, music ability. They're two different things, a, an ability and a skill and an interest. You know, the people on the autism spectrum, vehicles are a very common interest, trains, cars, airplanes. So if the child is interested in that, let's read about them. Let's do math with airplanes and take that interest and broaden it. Now this being, I'm also a very much an associative thinker. And just last week I went to a great STEM program 
in Salt Lake City that the state's actually paying for. And I watched an autistic 12 year old come in there and he totally got into it, 3D printing. And it took an hour and a half to print out a little tiny plastic airplane. And he was completely fixated on this, but he also acted a lot less autistic because other people there also had a shared interest in how the 3D printer worked. See, I like um, seeing that kid get involved in it. Now that's a specific example of an activity to help the autistic kid develop because he's got to do the 3D printer with other people there in the maker lab. Temple, what's so well documented is your mother's advocacy. She was an advocate for you in schools before there was even advocates in schools. Uh, and what she fought for was mentorship and teacher accountability and therapists. So can you talk about how important it was for your mother to be your advocate? I was the kind of kid that in the 50s, they used to just put away an institution. But then you have a lot of kids that are autistic where there's no speech to it. That used to be called Asperger's syndrome. Um, geeks and nerds would be the same thing. They have the characteristics of autism, but uh, there's no uh, speech delay. And a lot of granddads have come up to me and told me that they, they're finding out they're autistic when the kids get diagnosed. Now, here's another person that's autistic, Elon Musk. Right here, I'm holding Ashley Vance's book about Elon Musk. And I've got some yellow post-it notes that have been in there since the book was published where I marked the pages where I thought Elon Musk was autistic. Now I can say it because it came out of the Saturday Night Live and told everybody. You know, I, I love that you, when you do presentations, you often talk about Elon Musk and Mozart and, and Einstein and people that you believe are on the autism spectrum and this continuum. So let's talk about that. You're in great company. This is the problem with autism. When I was a young child at three, I looked really severe. Now, one thing that was in my favor, I did not have epilepsy. And the first doctor I went to was a neurologist who tested me for epilepsy. And if you have a child who's not talking, obviously you have to make sure they're not deaf. You've got to rule that out. And um, then once that's ruled out, she recommended a speech therapy school that um, my two teachers just did it in their house. And they had, you know, about six uh, kids in a class. And they, there was a lot of emphasis on learning how to wait and take turns. Well, this is one thing that's good about the 3D printer I was watching. Uh, this is kind of a delicate little device that moves its control by the laptop, but um, it's a mechanical device. It's quite delicate, and it requires patience. It takes an hour and 20 minutes to make one little plastic airplane. It's maybe this, you know, maybe four inches long. Um, but the, um, you know, the kid totally got involved in that. I had a wonderful third grade teacher. Then I had my science teacher in high school. And for the first three years I was in high school, um, I didn't do any studying. In fact, I got kicked out of a regular high school for throwing a book at a girl who teased me in ninth grade. Had to go to, for, to school for kids with problems. They, they had me run the horse barn for three years. Rather expensive school of horse barn management. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I learned from that was I learned how to work. And I'm realizing just how important that was. And then the last year that I was there, Mr. Carlock was, came and he gave me interesting science projects. So now I was motivated to study because studying now is a pathway to a goal. Yeah, that's really important. You know, what I've loved about your work is you always pay an ode to the 50s. It taught you manners. It taught you how to, how to wait your turn. It taught you how to be self-reliant. Your mom made you get internships and, and work over the summer. Uh, yes, I had, we were learning work skills. I mean, we were selling candy for charity uh, around the neighborhood. And when I was about 10, my sister and I had a really uh, catastrophically bad Kool-Aid stand. <laughs> we ran out of sugar and we found out how much sugar was in Kool-Aid. But you learned you better have enough supplies. You know, you learn something from that. And... And in the 50s, kids were taught. And that's why a lot of the granddads ended up having jobs. Manners were taught in a really systematic way. And they used what I call teachable moments. So if I stuck my finger in the mashed potatoes and licked it, uh, mother didn't scream, no. She just said, use the fork. Other people think that's disgusting when you do that. She'd calmly tell you what to do. And, and if I went over to the next door neighbor's house, the other mom would do the same thing. That's just the way it was done in the 50s. And 
I think that was helpful. I'm seeing too many kids today, smart kids with a label, never gone shopping. Mm. I was shopping by the time I was seven and eight years old. I also like how you talked about board games, that you have to wait your turn. And now when kids do video games, they're autonomous and alone and, and they're not they're not taking turns. The problem with the video game stuff is these kids are not becoming video game designers. So they're just ending up stuck in their basement or the bedroom. Uh, and and there's been three cases where an adult with autism were weaned off of video games successfully with car mechanics. And they found that car mechanics is more interesting than video games. So yes, visual thinkers also are the mechanical people. Now there's just been a big hurricane that smashed all the power poles. They've got hundreds and hundreds of utility workers. Well, some of those utility workers that have to put the stuff back together, and I've worked with a lot of those kind of people in the meat plants, they're gonna be some of your visual thinkers. Don't stick your nose up at skilled trades. It takes a lot of skill to put all that stuff back together again or to build it in the first place. Temple, I'd, I'd like you to speak about your middle school years. You know, middle school is a tough time for anyone, but sadly you were bullied. And I think that bullying is what led to you throwing the book and eventually getting expelled. So can you tell our audience about those really tough middle school years? A lot of kids are bullied in elementary school. And the, re and the reason I wasn't is Mrs. Beach, he was the head teacher for my little elementary school, a little tiny small school, um, explained to the other kids that I had a disability, but it was not visible like crutches or a wheelchair, and that they needed to be helping me, not torturing me. I've now learned that's called peer-mediated intervention. Mm. And I've got a paper online that's titled How Horses Help the Teenager with Autism uh, Make Friends and Learn How to Work. You can look that up online. And I looked, I actually reviewed some of the research on peer-mediated intervention. And that um, helped me. Um, high school was just the worst. And then when I went to the special school, I was still bullied. I was called tape recorder, because I always repeated the same phrases. I was called bones, because I was skinny. And workhorse, another thing I was called. And the only places I was not bullied was shared interests, riding horses, decorating plastic model horses with my roommate, and um, electronics lab and model rocket club because the students that participated in those activities were not the bullies. Friends through shared interests. I cannot emphasize that enough. Temple, I'd like for you to talk about your mentor, the esteemed science teacher, Mr. Carlock, who formerly worked at NASA, who really encouraged you to expand on your idea of creating a hug machine. Can you tell us about that influence with that incredible teacher of yours? He encouraged me with that because I watched cattle go in the squeeze chute and I noticed sometimes cattle calm down and squeak in the squeeze chute to hold them still from getting their vaccinations. And um, he, he suggested that I build it and then also do a little experiment, which um, I did as an undergraduate thesis, which actually finally got written up. I've got a paper on it in a psychiatric journal. So I was really happy to get that, get that actually academically uh, published. Uh, now, one of the things that really holds back a visual thinker like me is I can't do algebra. Absolutely can't. I took a biomedical engineering class. I had to drop it and I was, because I couldn't do the math. But this brings up a really important thing about engineering. There's the industrial design side of engineering. That's me. Uh, and then there's the more mathematical side of engineering. And when I was out working on these great big meat plants, it's very interesting when they build the whole factory right from the ground up, how the labor is divided up on who designs stuff. I, had, I worked with a lot of people, <coughs> I worked with a lot of people that um, maybe just a high school graduate, took a drafting class in high school, that own a metal fabrication shop and have 20 patents. And they do what I call the clever engineering department. The very clever visual things, mechanical things, then you, then you have the parts of the plant that are more abstract, boilers, refrigeration, roof snow loads, things like that. That's done by the engineer the, with the college degree. And, but you still have to have the clever engineering department. And I'm very getting concerned that our education system is screening out a lot of the people like me. And uh, well, they had to get a lot of people like me to put the utilities all back together after the hurricane smashed everything. Um, that's highly skilled work. I'm not I, talking about just roofing a warehouse. I love, that, I love that you're an advocate for 
for diversified learning for yes, absolutely arts. absolutely and in my book, the autistic brain i present the science that shows that these different kinds of thinking actually really do exist there's science and i'm an object visualizer who look at things in pictures and then you have the mathematical mind that thinks more in patterns and there's scientific research now that supports that and an extreme object visualizer is not going to be also an extreme mathematician. And there's lots and lots of people kind of in the middle, but we need the different kinds of minds. One of the reasons why Zoom took over was easy to use. That's the interface. The more mathematical mind has to program it. Temple, what I find fascinating is how you have identified that you are a visual learner. And you often refer to your brain as your individual Google. As you're searching for data, you search for these photos and these images, these visual images in your brain. So can you tell our audience about what it means to be a visual learner? I'm what's called a bottom-up thinker, where a highly verbal thinker will have an abstract policy, but no idea how to implement it. But to make a bottom-up thinker good at thinking, I have to have lots of experiences. You've got to get out and experience lots of stuff to fill the database. That's why I read a whole lot of stuff. I've traveled a great deal. And when I got to be about 40, that's when I thought, boy, I can really think really good now because I filled the database. And I've had parents tell me that when they got their kid off the couch and got them out um, doing a job, they said, well, he just blossomed mm -hmm. because you see you're filling the database. Well, you were a million mile, mile flyer. You've written nearly 10 books. I think you have nine books, 60 articles published in academic journals. So you're, you've definitely seen the world. I've been in all of Western Europe. I've been to a good parts of South America, Canada. I've been in a lot of different countries, um, China, Asia, Japan, Philippines. Um, Travel's a great educator. Can we talk about, you, you, you said something earlier that just made me very sad. And, I, and I'm, you know, you're, I know that when you were born and, and in that early age of, of not being verbal, that an option at that time was to institutionalize children. Well, the thing that was bad in the 50s is that the kids that didn't know how to talk, they usually just institutionalized. And the more Asperger type of kids, uh, they, they usually ended up getting jobs. Now, where they had problems was in their relationships. And I've got another book called Different Not Lessons, 18 people telling about their lives um, uh, when they got diagnosed later in life because of relationship were a mess. And that's where the diagnosis helped them. But today, I'm seeing too many kids held back, smart kids that have uh, never gone grocery shopping. This is ridiculous. They have learned, you know, aren't taught how to use a bank account, just basic stuff like that. Can we talk about relationships then? I, I know that sometimes on the autism spectrum that that social interaction could be difficult or a struggle. And, and was it like that for you? Well, I can share interests. I get down and we sit down and talk, talk about how we're going to build something. That um, That's really fun. I have problems with some of the chit chat. And part of the reason is I can't follow it. I don't think that um, fast. I, I don't just shift attention quickly. And there's kind of a rhythm of conversation I still can't do. People say, well, Temple interrupts during interviews. I know I do that. And part of the problem is I can't get the timing right. Because if, I'm a, if I was a computer, I'm only an Intel 286 with a really small working memory, but I've got the cloud for graphics storage. <laughs> interrupt away. Um, what you have to say is far more important than me. But they, they, um, and then we got to be careful on the first job with multitasking. Don't put them on some crazy busy takeout window. Temple, as, as a teacher, I really appreciate how candid and honest you've been about your own personal overload. When, when you have that, that sensory overload, it often can make you feel that you're shutting down. And so a lot of young people who are on the autism spectrum also have that same sensory overload. So can you tell the audience, specifically teachers, maybe some signs that we can look out for? These sensory issues vary a whole lot. And uh, loud noises hurt my ears. I didn't like balloons when I was a child because you never know when they're going to pop. 
Now, one of the ways to help with the sound sensitivity is to let the child control the thing that makes the noise. Like uh, there were some kids that would, in high school, be really good building things in shop, but they couldn't stand the sound of some of the tools. Well, the thing is to do is let them go down at the shop and turn the electric bill on and off and nobody's there. Or the buzzer on the scoreboard, they hate that. They'll go down when nobody's there in the gym and they turn the buzzer on and off. Or the hairdryer on and off. Whatever the thing is where they control it. But there's some people that need sensory breaks. Another big problem I had was anxiety. And that was horrible through my 20s. I've been on medication for 40 years. And I described that in detail in my book, uh, Thinking in Pictures. I have a whole chapter on it. And I, if you were interested in my, my experience with medication, I strongly recommend reading the book because I do not want any misunderstandings about medication. But I question whether I would have been as successful if I had not taken it because I found out later on that my fear center was three times bigger than normal. And, and what the medication did is it, it calmed down my fear circuits. That's what it did. You know, and I, I appreciate you talking about medication. You know, a lot of our parents, educators, teachers um, may also be on medication. And, and you've always been an advocate in, in moderation to be conservative, but that it lessened your anxiety. You, you, you said you used to be, sit in a room and, and be so fearful. Well, I'd be so fearful. Like, I was just paralyzed. And, and I, way too many meds are given out to little kids, way too much. But then I know other people, especially visual thinkers like me, or a little bit of Prozac uh, has made all the difference in the world. And one of the mistakes that's made with antidepressants is taking too high a dose. And then you get agitation and insomnia. That's a complete mess. Um, but I, I uh, did the dip bat projects that were so newly before I had meds. But then I don't know, uh, uh, my health was getting worse and worse and worse because of a constant anxiety. And then I went on a little dose of antidepressant and it like throttled back my nervous system. Instead of going 200 miles an hour, I would now vary from 55 miles an hour to maybe 100 miles an hour. Instead of 100 miles an hour to 200 miles an hour. Okay, I'm sorry, I should have used some metric measurements. But <laughs> it, it, um, I, it like throttled down my extreme fear and started response. In fact, in the, in the book, I said it's like adjusting the idle screw on an old fashioned carburetor. There's not many people in the world that can say that Claire Dane played them. What an Emmy, for, uh, your, the film that is about your life, Dipple Grandin, was nominated for 15 Emmys, won seven, and was a, a window into people's homes and lives and conversations. And what was it like for you to suddenly be in people's homes, at their dinner tables, and implementing educational reform in schools? Well, I figure it's a responsibility. Now, that's the way I look at it. Claire Danes kind of became me. Um, the movie shows visual thinking completely accurately. Also shows all the projects I did uh, really accurately. Um, and I'm, I'm a person who likes to get things done. And he was asking, what can we do to help with fixing schools? One thing they need to be doing is put all the hands-on classes back in. Cooking, sewing, woodworking, art, theater, music. I mean, I was exposed to a little flute when I was a child. I could never figure out how to play it. But you give that to some other kid, and they're going to take off with it and do really great. Get the mechanical classes back into high school, shop, and welding. I worked with two people that definitely would be labeled autistic today. They were saved by a single welding class in high school. And one of them owns a very large metal fabrication company and he sells his stuff all over the world. And that was one welding class that, that got him started in his career. Now for somebody else, that would not be the thing. You see, what I'm, what I'm proposing is they get exposed to enough different things, figure out what they love, but also figure out, well, no, I don't really don't like doing this. I actually hated the cooking class. Speaking of being exposed, your, your mother had the insight to give you two choices. You could go for a week or a summer to visit your aunt in Arizona who owned a ranch. And and let's talk about that. That's how I ended up in the cattle industry. Hadn't gone to my aunt's ranch, so I probably wouldn't be in the cattle industry. See, another thing that was an advantage in the cattle industry is you can do engineering without an engineering degree. I always just called myself a livestock consultant, but I did 
lived on the lots of engineering, lots of steel and concrete work, um, and some mechanical stuff. Um, and and in the in the meat industry, there were people just working in maintenance, and they were designing whole entire plants. And their, their title might be draftsman, but they were doing a lot more than just doing drafting. I can tell you that. Have the single CAD course at a community college, and this guy was designing entire factories. I worked with them. But you came up with this great cliche. You said nature is cruel, but we don't have to be. So well, that's right. I mean, when the hyenas like rip your guts out. Um, eat on you while you're still alive. That is not very nice. Yeah, you know, we don't have to be doing that kind of stuff. You know, so we've you... got to give the animals that we um, use food a decent life. I was just actually on a very big um, animal welfare Zoom conference for the last day and a half with Tyson. And there's an animal welfare guideline called the five domains. Uh, where you things like nutrition and health and behavior. Uh, but one of the things that's in that is the animal needs to have some positive emotions and have a life worth living. And I worked on developing um, scoring systems for meat plants, very simple ways of scoring them uh, to measure things like, um, you know, use of electric prods, animals falling down. Um, it's real simple metrics that uh, prevent some of, you know, prevent abuse from happening. What I love about what you've been able to do is you have great empathy and compassion for the animals um, because you you believe that they too are visual thinkers. Animals are sensory-based thinkers. In fact, my student, Megan Corgan, just finished up a really interesting study, the horse, to show that when horses get afraid of things, it, it's a visual thinking. Uh, she took a plastic playset, a very colorful playset that had a slide and a sling for toddler. You know, it was, uh, you know, like four foot by four foot or just slightly a, a meter, meter and a half by a meter and a half, well, not that big, fit on a pallet. That's internationally the same. And, and think about the slide on the place that if I hold this stapler this way, it looks different than this way. Okay, the slide on the place that's gonna look different. So she set it up in an alcove in the, in the stable and walked at young uh, horror broken uh, colts and fillies by it um, 15 times. Now everything was done at a walk because we didn't want any horses really getting scared. And she looked at, uh, well, did they put their head up? Did they blow their nostrils out a little bit? Did they stop? And when they first saw it, they would do that. And then they would habituate. So now you've got colts and fillies totally habituated to this little plastic place that now you rotate at 90 degrees, it became something new. Now, if you've been galloping your horse, that would have, could have been a serious accident. That place that became a new thing when you turned it because it looked different. It looked really different. We would just go, yeah, that's a kid's toy. You know, we got a bigger cortex and the horses got. But that shows right there that a horse is a visual thinker and it would explain some of the spooking and bucking people off that seems to happen for no reason. But I think with your the way you process and your sensitivity, you ultimately had empathy for for cows who were scared if there was a flag that was waving or if there was a piece of a fence that was teetering. I noticed they'd stop at a shed. They'd stop, there was a coat hanging over the side of his chute. Other people hadn't noticed that because if you think in words, you might have a hard time imagining how an animal could even have a thought. They didn't think in words. You know, and there's actually still some big discussions about animal consciousness. Well, when you think in pictures, I don't think in words. It's obvious to me, the animal thinks. It also was obvious to me to look at what cattle were looking at. And something as simple as taking the coat off the fence solved the problem. Now, let's say I have a dairy cow and she walks into the milking parlor every day and there's a coat on it, and she'll get used to that. But the new heifer that goes in the first time, she's going to stop. When you started working in an industry that was probably more male dominated on these ranches and working with livestock, do you feel that you were embraced um, with your new methodology and the way that you were bringing sensitivity to this industry? Well, uh, being a woman was the biggest barrier in the 70s, early 70s. Um, and most of the trouble I had was at the middle management and the foreman level. It was not the owner of the feed yard or the big boss. It was his middle management people that felt threatened. That's what almost all the trouble was. 
The other thing that I learned to do was to sell my work. So I would show drawings to people. I'd show pictures to people. I'd show people off what my work was like. In fact, here are some drawings that I have that are in my book, Thinking in Pictures. Wow. And then this book's been through a few Zoom calls so the pages started to fall out. Um, but I learned to sell my work rather than myself. And I've been having a lot of discussions with employers. They said, we need to get rid of the regular interview. Stop. The people with autism don't do well with that. And just have them come in and show all of, give them a programming project and let's see how they do. They're a math person. Or if there's someone like me, give me an industrial design project and see how I do with it. What I also love is you've asked us to look at language. You know, I think oftentimes the word disability um, disabled starts in such, and as an English teacher, it's difficult for me to take those, those negative words and you promote diversity in, 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 in the way that people process. If you didn't have visual thinkers, you never get the power back on and all that stuff's been trashed, all these big poles, big high line poles smashed over. Um, and I'm getting concerned about who's going to be the young line men coming in. It's a two year community college degree. And I'm just seeing kids getting screened out with the algebra requirement. And you do need a certain amount of mathematics, but you don't need abstract algebra that you don't need, unless you're actually designing power grids. That's for the math heads. That's not for me. As a fellow million mile flyer, um, you and I zigzag the country and I often have spoken in school districts where you had just been and you are making education better. So what are some of the things that you like to leave as a takeaway? Because I know you're realist and pragmatic. What do you want schools to do better? Putting all the, all the hands-on classes back in because some of these kids that are different, that's where they excel. Art class, music class, um, you know, welding. Some really like cooking. Um, theater. Now, I wasn't interested in acting in the play, but I've made I made sets and costumes for every single well, elementary school, high school, and college. But that's something that can turn into a career. I also love that you fight fiercely to get rid of stigmas and stereotypes and shame. Um, I really like the Paralympics and the fact that it's in the same venues and everything because you're showing what people can do. I don't like all these disabilities being lumped together because um, the kind of um, problems I have are very different than a blind person or somebody in a wheelchair. You see, I don't think about it in words. I mean, I see a wheelchair when I see it. In fact, I saw a wheelchair the other day and was hooked up to one of those little scooters. I'm going really fast. What was it like for you when you, when you si suddenly had a diagnosis? Um, and I know it didn't come till years later. Did, did that help or hurt? And, and what does a diagnosis mean to you and, and ultimately to others? Well, I'm concerned with the work side of things, the diagnosis holding them back. I'm seeing a lot of parents who can't let go. They don't think their kid can learn to drive. They don't think their kid can learn to hold a job or even shop at the supermarket. Um, but where a diagnosis helps is the older person with relationships. That's where it's helpful. Let's discuss driving. I got this little prop right here. You can thank our local farm credit union. Just this year, gave out these cute little trucks. And this is what I learned to drive on. It's an exact replica of it. It had three on the tree, a horrible clutch. <laughs> and I started in the horse pasture. It's going to take longer. You're going to have to spend a lot more time learning to drive the vehicle until you touch track. I did horse pasture for you know, several hours. And then we started driving to my aunt's mailbox, which would be three miles or six kilometers from the ranch. So that was 20 minutes driving every day on a dirt road in a really safe place. This is where you gotta start big parking lots. Oh, the deserted office parks, those are good places to practice. Um, if you're in Texas, the oil field roads, great place to practice. And you start out in, in big fields and deserted parking lots, places that are completely safe. And it's going to take longer. And sometimes in the driver's ed programs, they shove them into it way too quickly. It's going to take a lot more time practicing driving. So that the, you see, for me, the clutch and the gear shift had to get on autopilot before I touched traffic. That's called motor memory. But if I hadn't learned to drive, that would have really limited my work in the livestock industry. But I believe you, you're such a 
proponent of agency and independence. And I love that you fight for others to have agency. And just learning basic skills. I'm realizing now that the 50s tradition of giving a kid allowance, and I got 50 cents a week, that bought about $5 worth of stuff. And mother had certain items that were allowance items. It's pretty standard in our neighborhood. And I could buy five comics or I could get 10 candy bars. But if I wanted a 69 cent balsa wood airplane with a propeller, I had to save for two weeks. And I'm realizing the important things that taught. Another thing they did in my neighborhood about the same age is that when the parents had a party, you had to dress up in your best clothes and greet the guests and pass out the snacks and learn how to talk to the guests. That taught social, uh, social skills. And, and if you didn't, you forgot to say please or thank you, a mother would cue me. You forgot to say. And, and I'm realizing how important that was. And a lot of the grandfathers I've talked to who've been employed also um, they said it was really important. And they learned to work by having paper routes at age 11. So we've got to find jo volunteer jobs to replace that childhood paper route, like maybe volunteering at a church, volunteering at a farmer's market or some neighborhood community center. I love that. When, when we think about the, the squeeze shoot and how that became your high school science project with your hug machine, can you talk about why folks on the autism spectrum often need that, that intimacy? It's just deep pressure. And, and okay, a lot of people say, well, I go to the dentist and they put that heavy apron on you for the x-rays. A lot of people kind of like that apron. Mm -hmm. That's just an example of deep pressure. And, and there are some people that have autism that, um, or, or, or that really like that, um, that pressure. And there's others that don't. See, this is where sensory things are very, very variable. Also, by using the squeeze machine, which I could control. See, that's another important thing. Then I got to where I could tolerate hug people hugging me. And now I, I understand that your machine broke. In that interim between the, the machine breaking and COVID and, and being vaccinated, to hug, what was that like? Did you miss that deep pressure? Yeah, I'm hugging a few people now that I'm fully vaccinated. Uh, one thing that's helped me during COVID, I really recommend this. When the lockdown was, get up every morning, shower to dress for work by seven every morning. And I'd let the showers beat on my face and I'd feel a lot better when I got out. It made a difference. Mm. In other words, don't just lounge around in your jammies. When you talked about your peer mediation in elementary school, um, what I have learned is some of the best learning I have learned as an educator is with relationships with people who are on the spectrum. I want, I want to tell you about two specifically, and I'd love for you to give them some advice. Um, okay. One is a exquisite gentleman. He just graduated. Okay. Um, well, the first one, his name is Jaden. Um, he is a freedom writer, author, ambassador, and he just graduated from high school. Okay. And Jaden uh, was taken from his class and put often in a resource. And it led to teasing and bullying. And he he didn't understand what his diagnosis was. He called it ass, A-S-S, -S, like ass, burgers, like the, the burgers you eat at McDonald's. Well, so yeah, he yeah, called yeah. ass burgers, ass burgers, which I thought was delightful. Um, yeah. okay. And now that he's on the other side of school, um, what I love that he's become is an advocate for not making kids feel different and be different. So if, if you could tell... Jaden, um, who's now just beginning his academic career in higher education, what would be a recommendation for someone who has Asperger's? I'll make a recommendation. I'd tell every student, every student, doesn't matter what, whether they have autism or they're autistic or whatever. Uh, if you get in trouble in a class, let's say you fail a quiz, do something about it right away. Like get tutoring or something. Always have flunked a class or fail a class realize we're talking to other countries might not know what flunk meant. Um, and and uh, the other thing is do lots of different things, different internships, uh, get involved with a lot of different activities, things that can lead to jobs. I can't emphasize that enough. Well, just uh, uh, help with the research, professor's research. You can look up there publications. So they'll usually be published on the departmental web page and get involved in a lot of those things. So you can start doing things that will lead to a job 
I think there needs to be a gradual transition from the world of school to the world of work. And I've uh, students that are in the pipeline right now I recommend two real jobs before they graduate from high school. And one of the big problems I'm seeing for autistic kids is that differentiation is not being made where a simple job like maybe pushing carts in the grocery store is a training job. That's a training job for me. And for some other individual, it might be a suitable career. And that distinction is not being made. But learning the work skills, I'd recommend it in the summer that he um, get some jobs. Because what you don't want to have is sudden transition that you get where you're out of school. Now, what do I do? Great. So getting work experience while he's in co college. The other thing is you'll be a much better advocate if you can tell other students um, how, you might, how you got a job at an office supply store. That was one that was real successful, quiet, and got recognized for knowledge of every printer that was in the place. Um, but getting those kind of experiences before you graduate, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, trying lots of different things. I've just got a new graduate student in and she, we had lunch today and we talked about some of the things she wanted to do and I strongly recommended, um, you know, talk to Terry, who's one of our other professors, about some of the uh, research that's going on at, at the experiment station and get involved with helping them work out. Get involved with the horse experiments or you know, horse research or whatever. Get involved in a whole bunch of different things and you're gonna see what you like you're also going to go, yeah, I hate that. I never want to do it. It's also important to find that out, too. The other question I have for you is a Freedom Rider teacher. Her name is Carol Ann. And when I met her and I discovered that she also is on the autism spectrum, I invited her to a teacher training. And she said, I can't come. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a teacher. And I said, Carol Ann, you very much are because you're going to come to this training and teach us about the autism spectrum. So for those that are not in school, their parents, their adults, what can they give to society? I had some problems. I had another good mentor. His name was Jim Uhl. He was a former Marine Corps captain starting a small steel and concrete business to build cattle handling facilities. And he seeked me out. And he was another very important mentor. And I had a problem on one job. The customer wasn't satisfied. And he says, no, you don't give up. you just got to keep on going. He was another super important mentor. And there was another former army officer um, that was the superintendent of the local Swift meatpacking plant. He was another person who was extremely helpful. And and um, it's interesting, they were both former military officers. You know, there's sort of a no-nonsense, get-it-done mentality that they have that I seem to resonate with. Most people really helped me. You never know where you're going to find find mentors, but Jim was attracted to me because he'd seen my drawings and he needed somebody to design projects for him to build. Mm. And we made, for 10 years, we built jobs together. And then I went away to Illinois and the, the cattle industry got less in Arizona. And he went off and did commercial construction stuff. As a former time 100 person of the year, you were in the heroes category. I'd like you to give advice to the four-year-old Temple, who was learning to speak, was going to go to school shortly. Um, what advice would Temple now, with her PhD and her books and her advocacy, tell a four-year-old Temple if you were a four-year-old Temple's mentor? Well, I want to get him out doing things. And that's why I did books like The Outdoor Scientist, where I described the rock collection my sister and I had. Um, you know, observing animal behavior. I have another book, Calling All Minds. When I was about six, I was making little bird kites and parachutes and tinkering and tinkering. Let's get that kid out there doing things. We got kids today that are growing up that never used a tool. They aren't doing enough just um, hands-on on stuff. And I went to Make a Fair about five years ago, and the big hit there was large cardboard boxes that things like washing machines and refrigerators came in and the kids were making stuff out of them. Yeah, what are those boxes you can get them for free? I'm, I've also talked to a lot of low income folks. So I'm always looking for things that they can do that don't, don't cost a lot of money um, where they can get kids just making stuff. You know, find a retired mechanic and teach them how to fix lawnmowers. I wouldn't do that with a four year old, but 
<laughs> uh, how can a kid find out he likes mechanics if they're never exposed to mechanical things? You see, this whole thing of exposure to careers is really, really important. I did a whole, I uh, looked up Michelangelo, and I think he was a, a artistic. And one, two things helped him. He was exposed to the art. Every church was commissioning all this art, and he'd be walking around looking at that. He also grew up in a family that were stone cutters, so he got introduced to the tools at an early age. What, what advice would Temple Grandin now give to the 14 year old girl that you threw the book at? Because clearly she was insecure and bullying you, but what, what advice would you give her now? I don't know. The people that bullied me uh, have never reconnected with me. They now, a lot of other people from elementary school, high school that I was friends with, I have reconnected with some of those, but the people that were the big bullies, they've never come up to me and reconnect, made any attempt to reconnect. And if they did, what, what would you say to them? I don't know. I'd be interested in one girl who bullied me. I found out became a counselor. Uh, but I found that out from somebody else. Um, and the other ones, I don't know where they're at. Sadly, Temple, as someone on the autism spectrum, you were bullied in school and often sent away. And what makes me really disheartened is that teachers, administrators, and even principals did not intervene or advocate on your behalf. Luckily, your mother did. So for parents out there, what could they learn from these lessons when a parent is an advocate? They, um, like my mother has a book and, and she's really mad at that school for, you know, not handling things better. Now, fortunately, at the time, mother was uh, working as a journalist, uh, looking at special schools. So she'd been, in, been to a whole bunch of special schools as a journalism um, project doing a TV show for NPR. And um, she picked out three schools to let me choose. Mother always believed in giving some choices. And, and um, the school I went to had a farm. And they did lots of hands-on things. They had horses to ride. And, and that was... That, all, that was really helpful, but there was bullying going on there, especially in the cafeteria. And when I walked across the parking lot, they'd be yelling, tape recorder. Mm. And I didn't know at the time why they were calling me that. And they were calling me tape recorder because um, I've always kept using the same phrases. Temple, you mentioned that a lot of people on the autism spectrum often fixate. And you talk about taking that fixation and broadening horizons and doing something good, both professionally, personally, and academically. So can you elaborate about the importance of using fixation for good? Okay, let's say I talk, already discussed the difference between an interest or a fixation, that might be cars or something like that, from a skill, which might be mechanics, visual thinking, mathematics, and those skills need to be developed. And you can often use the thing that the child's interested in as the vehicle for, for teaching something like reading. I didn't read until I was eight years old. The first thing was to start with a book worth reading. And mother taught me with phonics. Another kid might be sight words. Some of kids are sight words, some are phonics. You know, use, use the method that, uh, that works. What you want to do is take that fixation and broaden it. So let's say for me, it was just doing a single horse head over and over again. Well, mother said, well, let's draw the stable. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, talk about a place you might ride a horse to. You see how I'm making an associative link back to the horse, but I'm broadening it. And you want to broaden it so it's less fixated. Temple, I appreciate how you pay homage to your mother. She found the perfect mentors for you, the perfect therapist for you. She sent you to the ranch to embolden you in your life's work. And so tell us a little bit more about the advocacy that your mother played in your development. She also realized that I needed to keep on moving and develop. See, what one problem I'm seeing with a lot of parents is they can't let go. When I suggest that their kid buy something in a store, one mom said she couldn't let go. And I was just talking about go in the store and buy some printer paper. And she broke down and said, well, I can't let go. He's 16 years old, in good grades in school. 
and uh, she's crying over printer paper. She knew, she was always stretching me to do new things, not throwing me in the deep end of the pool, but um, she was instrumental in getting Ann out at the ranch to teach me driving. So she decided that that was something I needed to get done by the end of the summer. That was mother's idea to do that. Um, I was very lucky that the mailbox was three miles or six kilometers away because that was just the perfect practice. It took exactly 20 minutes to go up and back to that mailbox. If that mailbox had been a quarter of a mile away, uh, half a kilometer, I wouldn't have gotten as much driving practice. We had to pick the mail up anyway. But that, um, um, she had a very good sense of how to stretch me and get me out exposed to new things. Because as a bottom-up thinker, in order to have a lot of knowledge, I got to see a lot of stuff to put information into my database that's in my brain. Mm. I have to read things. I have to see things. I have to do things to do that. Well, I think for our audience, um, we live in a world where there's a lot of bottom-up thinkers. There's a lot of people who are on the spectrum and this continuum. So for my last question is for our audience, whether they are a student a parent, an educator, or just a citizen of the world, what is your advice for us to be inclusive and accepting of anyone who thinks differently than ourselves? First of all, you have to be aware that different thinking exists. When I was in my 20s, I thought everybody thought pictures the way I did. I didn't know that verbal thinking even existed. So the first step is realizing that different kinds of thinking exist. And I've said the same thing to like corporate managers. Um, and some people are very, very highly verbal, very top down in their thinking. And people like me, it's it, concepts are learned by specific example. And then I put the pictures into categories. Also the mathematicians tend to be more bottom up thinkers. Um, but, and these skills can complement each other. They can be complementary skills. Okay, right now I'm working on a book on visual thinking with my super verbal, super good co-author, Betsy Lerner. And the way Betsy rearranges my stuff, it's absolutely wonderful. But she couldn't get the stuff, make up some of the stuff I do or find <laughs> some of the stuff I do. Uh, when it comes to finding things online, I'm an extremely good surfer. And when I teach students how to surf online, I said, you gotta remember, let's say we're looking at some cattle stuff. There's six different words for cattle. You might have to do six different searches. You've got cow, bull, steer, heifer, calf, and calves. You might want to do, don't blob it all together. Do a separate search for each one. Let's say you want to look at grazing behavior. It might be cows and grazing behavior, steers and grazing behavior, cattle and grazing behavior. Three different searches. And you'll get some papers that will overlap, but you'll also get some different new ones. Temple, as a fellow educator, I love encouraging our audience to do a homework assignment at the end of our podcast. So my homework assignment today is simple. I want them to learn about you and more about the autism spectrum. To do so, they can watch the incredible Emmy Award winning film about you, or they can pick up one of your books. You are a voracious writer and scientists. So can you tell us about some of the books that you could encourage our audience to pick up and read? Thinking in Pictures is my autobiography and I just did a new afterword in it. And it has some of my ideas of education. Then I've got The Way I See It. This book is a lot of little short chapters and really great for teachers working with the younger kids. So those two are my you know, really important uh, autism books. And then I also have lots of livestock and animal behavior books. And I already talked about the outdoor scientist and calling all minds because we need to get kids out doing things. We've got kids today growing up today. They're afraid to make a mistake. I had a teacher ask me, I just couldn't believe it. The teacher asked me this. One of the projects is just a simple snowflake. I had a teacher ask me, what would happen to a kid's self-esteem that cut it wrong and the snowflake fell apart? I said, you get another piece of paper and you just try again. Now, if that doesn't work, you can look it up on YouTube. I'm sure you'll find directions there. You learn from your mistakes. But we, I think we have some teachers now growing up in such a verbal world that they're worried about a kid's self-esteem over a paper snowflake that fell apart. Like, <laughs> and this was within the last year I was asked this. This is recent. 
This is now I got asked that. Well, we're gonna we're gonna allow our audience to fail forward, to take risks, and to not be as fragile as that paper snowflake. Temple, you have just been exquisite. I can't wait to read more, to learn more, and I thank you for enlightening our audience. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been absolutely wonderful uh, talking to everybody, and um, I just want to see um, kids that are different just get out there and be what they can be. And um, you know, we need all the different kinds of minds, and they have complementary skills. I'm a freedom writer, and I have the pleasure to introduce an amazing woman. I met her when I was in high school. Without her, I don't think I would have accomplished the things I have. Here's Miss G. Okay, first of all, you are so beautiful. I just want to reach through the screen and, and give all of you a hug. You're beautiful. I'm so honored to be in your country right now. And hopefully through this time together, we can answer questions and have more of a dialogue. I know that you watched the, the movie yesterday. I hope you're not disappointed that I am not the actress Hilary Swank. I'm just an ordinary person. But with, with ordinary people, you can do extraordinary things. You can change and take risks and dare to dream and that's exactly what sue ellen my student who just introduced me did she didn't tell you but this is her i'm gonna put the book really close this is her when she was in high school do you see that so i've known sue ellen since she was a teenager uh, now she is a grown woman a lot of my students in, including sue ellen had a very difficult childhood and what I've learned sometimes is tough times make really tough people. And Sue Ellen was that person. As a young teenager, she was homeless. Her father had left the family. Her brother uh, died of a very rare disease. And when you're broken and you're sad, it's hard to get out of bed in the morning. It's hard to want to go to school. And so a lot of the Freedom Riders had stories very similar to that. And what I realized as their teacher is I had to know who they were, where they came from, and what their story was. And that's one of the things your teacher said about you is that you're strong and the strides that each and every one of you are making makes him so proud that he couldn't wait for me to meet you, to know you, and to celebrate you. Our story has shown that every single one of you has something to say, and it's important for people to listen. Aaron Gruel and the Freedom Writers created the Freedom Writers Foundation to provide educators with tools to empower all students to succeed. I felt it was really important for us to continue evolving and continue creating curriculum that went to where a student was at. When the pandemic hit, we knew intuitively that quick transition from in-class instruction to online learning would be difficult for a lot of educators and students. We created a 12-week curriculum that really looked at mental health parity in our classrooms. Showing those videos to my kids help them to see that they're not alone in this world. It's something that can be used with any person of any age. Just knowing that everybody on that screen was there to make sure kids didn't miss out. Please consider making a donation to the Freedom Writers Foundation so that we can continue to make heartfelt curricula to address students' social-emotional needs. When I look at Anna Quinlan's background, which is a bookshelf, the nerdy English teacher in me, my spirit is soaring because I believe that most of those books on that shelf of hers uh, have been written by her. Uh, she's written over 20 books. So hidden in that bookshelf are probably every copy of every book, both nonfiction and fiction, children's books and pictorials at all. So let's start there with your love of writing. Did your love of writing, Anna Quinlan, begin when you were in elementary school and were asked to read books? Or when did your love of writing begin? 
Oh, I'm so glad you asked the question that way because particularly for students, I love to answer that question. I don't love writing. I really hate writing. I really hate it. Every time I sit down at the computer and pull up a document and start to work on it, there's a Jiminy Cricket on my shoulder that says, well, this is not very interesting. Well, this is not very good. Well, this is not as good as the last one. Well, this is not what the last review said you did well. It, it's all those voices of doubt and insecurity. And I often think that writing is as much an exercise in security and self-acceptance as it is an exercise in putting nouns and verbs together. So I think it's very important for younger people who sit at the computer and struggle and therefore conclude that they can't write to know that in my experience, there are a lot of us who do this for a living who struggle too, who, who are always my alone. My <laughs> mind is alone right now because I just assumed because you've been a journalist, a columnist, and an author that it came easy and naturally for you. See, that's the big misconception that, and I think it's a, a particularly American point of view, that if you're good at something, it must mean that it's easy for you. And let's just think of this in terms of other professions. Um, Michael Phelps, most decorated Olympian. How did he get to be so good at swimming? He did it over and over and over again. And sometimes he failed. And sometimes he felt like he was pushing a rock uphill. A great surgeon becomes a great surgeon by doing it and then redoing it, thinking about it. And, and I, I, think, I think, again, we do this huge disservice to young people because when it doesn't come naturally to them, when it's not simple and easy, when a teacher says to them, this is a good start, but you need to take another crack at this. They don't hear, well, that's what writing's like. You write and then you rewrite. What they hear is, I failed. And I don't ever want any kid to feel that way because um, there may be inside that kid a real writer struggling to get out and they shouldn't mistake the struggle with lack of ability. Where were you when I was learning to be an English teacher? And <laughs> I don't say that rhetorically or facetiously. I, I mean that legitimately, because I think what you are, are able to demystify is that the struggle is real. And because I had students, as you know, the Freedom Riders who weren't natural born writers in their minds, it was a struggle and it was awkward and uncomfortable at first. And I wish I would have had, had that insight when I began my journey because it would have made it so much easier for me as well as so much easier for them. I wish I had at hand here a copy of the first draft manuscript of one of my books because if I did I would just shuffle through it for you and what you would see is my editor's annotations on virtually every page saying now sometimes saying nice or great or yes, all those things you want to say, and sometimes saying through an entire paragraph, which basically means this slows down the action of the book. And uh, I, I, it, I'm working on a book about writing for people who aren't professional writers. And, and one of the things that I say is that I hate that revision process, that I hate it and fear it, and, and I'm a big baby about it, and I sort of stomp around the house and say, she's never understood me, even though <laughs> she's edited every book I've done. Um, and then I do it because it makes the work better, and because when it's all said and done, and I look at the finished product, it's usually very hard for me to tell what was there originally and what I fixed because Kate Medina told me to fix it. I, I feel that with every book project that the Freedom Riders have worked on, that I feel first and foremost, I have an imposter complex. And then I get very insecure. And then I want to crawl under a table in fetal position and suck my thumb. Is that is that normal? <laughs> Yes. Is that, is that image of being fetal position something that a lot of writers feel 
Yes, because think about it. Writing isn't really, I, I mean, at some basic level, noun, verb, noun, verb, adjective, noun, verb, noun, verb, adverb. But what writing really is, particularly the kind of writing the freedom writers are doing is this. Hello, world. Look at me. Take me as I am, warts and all. That's the scariest thing on earth to say that. And so inevitably there's part of you that thinks, no, 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 let's not, let's do this. Let's do, hi world. Yeah. It's me. <laughs> um, except that, that nothing happens then. You know, in the, in the anniversary edition, the 20th anniversary edition of the Freedom Writers Diary, you have a young man who talks about um, publicly telling a very painful story about his past. And he talks about how he doesn't like to tell that story. But the reason he does it is because he looks out into an audience and he sees the face of another kid who is clearly thinking, I'm not alone. And that's what makes writers write. Because on, at that moment when someone says, you put my thoughts into words, you said what I was thinking, you made me feel less alone in the world. I mean, my God, could you do anything in your whole life more powerful than making another human being feel less alone. And, and that's why, despite the fact that, you know, I do hate and fear it. And every time I think I'm not very good at it, I keep on writing because of those moments of connection. And by the way, not only those moments of connection to other people, but those moments of connection to myself. I mean, sometimes I write a sentence or a paragraph and I look at it and think, oh, that's what I think. And, and those moments, you know, there's nothing like them. I want, I want to share, I'm just having this out of body experience right now. And I, I have to share when, when I was young, I would watch my father listen to classical music. It was usually like Vivaldi or Mozart and he would literally weep. And I could not understand, you know, my father was a professional baseball player at one point in his life. And this very macho man tearing up and, and weeping over something that was this wave of, of beauty. And when I listen to you, I feel that same feeling like I just want to weep. And I say that to you because when I first met you, uh, it was a, a moment for me of being an inappropriate fangirl. I was, I was such a, a voracious reader of your work. And I think because I was so insecure, the, the validation that you gave us, not just by writing in, in Newsweek, The Last Word, but the fact that you quoted us back to the world. And I remember weeping when I read it to the Freedom Writers. I drove around town and I bought every copy of Newsweek that I could find. I have 150 students, so I had to find 150 copies of Newsweek at the time. And we actually included what you wrote in our teacher's guide because I wanted the teachers that came after us to read what you wrote. And I, I want to know if I could share some of the things that you wrote then that make me weep, um, like my father listening to Vivaldi. Um, you titled it Write for Your Life. Um, and you said, Freedom Writers is about the power of writing in the lives of ordinary people. That's a lesson everyone needs. So kind of at the gate, you, you, you demystify that it's just for people in the ivory tower or those fancy publications. But the, here's where it really got to me. And then one day she, being this crazy teacher here, she gives them all marbled composition books and the assignment to write their lives ungraded, unjudged, and the world breaks open. So beautiful. You go on to say, writing can make pain tolerable, confusion clear, and the self stronger. Words on paper confer a kind of immortality to make sense of themselves. Anna, 
to have someone of your caliber, a, a Pulitzer Prize winning author, um, say those things about my students, about this process and this journey. Um, I feel like my father wanting to weep because your words to me are Vivaldi. They're so beautiful and poetic and I get it now. I didn't get it when I was a kid, but I get it now when something just moves your spirit um, and your words, even if it's not easy, are so poetic and so profound and yet so full of empathy. So where does that, where does that poetry come from? Oh, well, first of all, thanks, Erin. Um, you know, I don't, I don't really know. Um, uh, unlike, unlike, your students who really thought of themselves, who had learned to think poorly of themselves, who had learned to think that they were unteachable, as someone told you, who thought, who were told that they were stupid, that they had no future. I was lucky enough to be raised in a household in which there was an expectation um, that, that I was going to be and do something. To go back to your question, I had a certain facility with words from the time I was quite young. Um, but the important thing from your point of view to know about that is that facility with words was rewarded over and over again by teachers. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I always say is I am a writer because of teachers. Teachers are, except for my parents, teachers were the most important people in my life. My eighth grade nun, Mother Mary Ephraim, who was really smart and really tough, looked over her glasses one day at me as she was handing me back a paper and said, you are a writer. Now, who was I to argue with Mother Mary Ephraim? And one of the things that I think is um, so important is to emphasize that because there's not enough um, discursive writing going on in schools. There's too much writing to the test. There's too much, you know, the French Revolution had three main causes, describe them. Well, that's not really writing, that's kind of stenography. And what you want is for students to do pour their heart out writing and to be validated. It, maybe not validated as writers, but validated as feelers. And I was validated from a very, very young age. Um, and I think that that helped me embrace a kind of facility um, with words um, that, stayed, that stayed with me. Um, and the other thing is, uh, my son is, my, my elder son and I talk all the time about books that we both love and we have quite different tastes. And one of the things that, we've talked about is that I think there are, there are cool writers and there are warm writers. And cool writers um, are often very talented and hyper intellectual and warm writers are different. And I, I'm a warm writer. Um, I, I do feel that connection to the reader. I do feel when I'm writing as though there's, there's someone there, you know, because if I didn't, I wouldn't keep on doing it. And I think that that, um, that that feeling of connection is something that, that I try to have come through in the work. And I think in, in 2021, I think we all miss empathy and, and compassion with that. You know, we had a bully at a bully pulpit for so long that uh, your profession, your former profession as both a journalist and a columnist was the emotional pinata of our former president. And I think what you did every single day, whether it was starting at the New York Post and then eventually going to the New York Times and then to Newsweek, every day you showed up and you shared stories um, and you were anything but the enemy of the people. But how did that feel to have someone with power um, create a, a dialogue with others that journalists were not to be uh, trusted, um, that they were to be feared, that there was something called fake news. How did that feel knowing that you spent your entire career doing something that was so noble? Well, it, it felt 
pretty terrible, but I couldn't believe that the American people over the long haul were going to buy it. Um, you, you know, Americans are people who like to complain about things that they can't possibly give up. So, um, you know, they, there was all of the fake news from people who were glued to the news. Um, they might not have been glued to the kind of news that I consume. Um, but on the other hand, I had a greater ability to consume news than at any time in American history, because I could get the BBC on my computer. I could read the Chicago Tribune, the LA Times, as well as the New York Times and the Washington Post. Um, so the, ex the extent to which there was so much information out there, I find pretty heartening and thrilling. Um, and, and I almost feel as though since January, the idea of fake news has begun to dissipate, that it was, that it was kind of a, a manifestation of the cult and the cult leader has lost power and, and gone to Palm Beach. And, um, and suddenly, suddenly we're trafficking in, in facts and data again. So I wanna go back to you being a high school student and I love that you chose the Sister College of Columbia Barnard. Did you know as a high school student that you were going to be a writer professionally uh, when you went off to college. Was that what you pursued initially um, because your, your nuns and teachers said you were a great writer or did you have an epiphany in that beautiful ivory tower? Underneath my high school yearbook, it says that my goal is to write the great American novel. It's so arrogant that <laughs> it makes my eyes cross. Um, and in fact, my, my college... My college essay, which they resurfaced at some point because I was um, chair of the board at Barnard where I graduated, says something similar in, in very rounded handwriting that I don't really have anymore. Um, yeah, so that's really what I wanted. I, had, I didn't really have any ambitions to go into the newspaper business. Um, I really wanted to be a novelist. I was an English major, but with a concentration in creative writing at Barnard, which has produced more great female writers than almost any place on earth. I mean, Jhumpa Lahiri graduated from Barnard, Edwin Stantigat, Catherine Boo, um, Natalie Angier, Erica Jong. The list just goes on and on and on. Um, and um, I went there in part because um, I felt that I wasn't taken as seriously in high school as my male counterparts because I was female. And Barnard was then and remains a place that takes being a woman very seriously. Um, but while I was there, I realized that I couldn't quite figure out how I could be a novelist and make a living. And I really wanted to make a living. And, um, and I decided, um, I'd been the editor of my high school newspaper. I decided to try to get a newspaper job. Um, and first I, I was a copy girl at my local daily in New Jersey. And then I went to the post um, as a summer intern and stayed there after college. And then I went to the Times. You know, I, I watched some of your previous interviews and I love how you said that your first beat uh, in East Brunswick was probably one of the most difficult jobs, but you learn the most because you were kind of thrown into all these experiences. Uh, you were supposed to have the ear of the young folk, but it was the early 70s. And so everything that was happening culturally at that time was that youth movement. So what was it like to be on the beach as a college student, you know, covering these incredible movements, whether it was the Vietnam War or voter rights or civil rights? I didn't realize at the time how lucky I was. Um, first of all, that my editors would trust this 19 year old girl who really was green to go out and cover a story, but they did. And um, second of all, that, that this was this kind of, well, we didn't really realize what a cauldron of change the early seventies was. Uh, I mean, it's only in retrospect that it's as clear as it is now. So the anti-war movement, the women's movement, I, I, just, I just got to do an incredible um, array of stories when I was too young to really appreciate um, 
how important they were and too young to do a really first class job um, to which I have to add that I had um, the most spectacular editors um, at both um, the New Brunswick Home News and then at the Post who really never said to me, kid, what the heck are you doing here? You, you don't know what you're doing. Um, who just really helped me grow into the job in a, in a way that, you know, I just can't thank people enough for. You know what I, I love that you were able to do at that time. At, at 19, I understand that you went home um, from your sisterhood at Barnard uh, to help take care of your mother who sadly passed away from ovarian cancer. But that must have done something to your psyche um, that made you that makes you grow up faster than most, and that ultimately became the the work of one true thing, that also became a semi fictional feature film um, starring Meryl Streep as your mother. Um, so what was that like to go back and recount that really painful moment, and decide that this is going to become part of a, a semi-fictional work that would become both a best-selling book and then a, a heavily touted film where Meryl Streep was nominated for an Academy Award. Yeah, but Meryl getting nominated for an Oscar, I mean, you know, I feel like I could have written The Cat in the Hat and Meryl <laughs> would have got nominated for an Oscar. Um, I think there's two distinct parts of this, Erin. The first is that um, nursing my mother through the end stage of ovarian cancer um, and then um, working as a city desk clerk at the New Brunswick Home News while taking care of my three younger brothers and my sister before I went back to school. Um, completely changed my life in every way. I mean, I, I, I am, I am, I am the person I am in large part um, because first I was Prudence Quinlan's daughter and then I was her survivor. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that just, that just changes everything being a motherless daughter. Um, but I, I didn't really think of one true thing in that way. I think, I think in every novel you find something that, is not necessarily literally true of your life, but is kind of a touchstone um, of your life. For example, I, I have a novel called Still Life with Breadcrumbs in which um, the main character is a photographer who has been famous for a certain kind of domestic photography. And I, I'm not a photographer, but I understand what it's like to have people think of you in a certain kind of way because of the art that you produce, which is considered stereotypically female. So with one true thing, the touchstone was that I understand what it looks like when someone's dying by inches of cancer. But um, Kate Golden, the mother, and Ellen Golden, the daughter, are, are so different in so many ways from my mother and I that it, it, it sort of changes the whole thing. I, I think the exciting and miraculous moment was I, I created, I, I want to say a two-dimensional picture, but that's not really true because one hopes in the reader's mind that it's all become very three-dimensional, but certainly on the page, there it is, you know, and then to have them bring it to life, to walk into a house that was decorated just as I described and have Meryl embody Kate in a way that was just as I imagined her. That's that's kind of that, it's incredibly exciting when that happens, particularly when it's done by really good people with really clear intentions. And that was my good luck. Do you think Renee Zellweger, who played the daughter, had elements of you as as that young woman? Uh, I think to the extent that she was kind of hard and ambitious. Um, at the beginning and eventually came to understand the value of the kind of life her mother had lived and the kind of person her mother was. I, I, I certainly think that she embodied some of the qualities that I had when I was much younger um, before, frankly, I grew up. You know, when you, when you look at your breadth of work and over 20 books, um, from nonfiction to fiction, to children's art, to actually pictorials, it's fun to kind of guess when you are the reader, how much of Anna Quinlan 
is in all these stories. If they are fictionalized, how much is real? If they're, they're nonfiction, um, how much of that is um, you're, you telling your truth? I was so excited with your story, Good Dog Stay, because I have a Labrador whose name is Bo, and your Labrador whose name was Bo. And I, I, I love to have a little taste of what it was like to write a book about your beloved dog. You know, I wrote a column first for Newsweek and writing the dog column is kind of the cliche of columnizing. If you're going to do it, you've really got to do a good job because so many people have tried to do it before. And and my editor sort of circled around to me and said, look, you know, I really think this cries out to be a book. And I thought, oh, no, <laughs> not the dog book. But, you know, pe- it's it's one of those things where people connect so viscerally to you that when you do it, you're glad that you did it. And that's, that's how I, I feel about it. I mean, we, you know, let's see, since Bo, there was B who is on the back cover of Good Dog Stay. And now B is no longer with us. And now there's Gus and Gus's younger number is named Ella. And Ella might be my last Labrador because she's three. And by the time she's an old dog, which is really hard to imagine because she's a young Labrador, which is nothing like an old dog. um, I'll be 80. And I'm not sure I'm up for a new Labrador at 80, but I guess I'll wait and see how I feel then. Well, I love that book because Bo is our therapy dog. I, I bring him to work every day. So every Every freedom writer has grown up with Bo and every freedom writer teacher I've trained has met Bo. And I was very self-conscious when our interview started because Bo's at my feet and he's very naughty. So traditionally in our interviews, he'll pant, he'll fart, he will bark, a combination of all three. So just forewarning you that, that Bo is nearby and you, you might hear some noises. Um, that will, that, will, that will have zero effect on me. <laughs> <laughs> I figured if anyone would, would understand you, you would understand with our mutual love affair with our, our, our dogs named Bo. You know, what I loved about Black and Blue, this was nothing about your personal life. Um, but a, another best-selling book that became uh, an award-winning film on television. And how do you create characters where they're so different from you? You have this beautiful, loving husband that you met in college and these three great kids. And then you write this story about extreme domestic violence and um, escape and, and, and that horrific story playing out also through the eyes of a young child. So how did you think of something like that, that that is not your personal personal touchstone? Well, first of all, critics and, and reviewers have believed that every single protagonist in each of my novels is me. Even though they're very different from each other, there's always that that way that they find the connection. And there always is a connection because writing fiction is a little like making sausage. Everything I am, everyone I know, everything I've seen gets ground up and comes out in, in the last analysis. So in, in Black and Blue, what I, re- I, I did not seek to write a novel about domestic violence. I didn't know anything about domestic violence. I've never researched domestic violence. Um, I, I was thinking about the fact that women become clothed in the people that they love and care for. So if you ask a woman about herself, she identifies as somebody's mother, somebody's wife, somebody's friend, somebody's daughter. And if a woman lost all of that, what would it take for her to recreate herself? If she'd lost all of those beloved layers. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, that none of the women I know in real life would intentionally give up any of that. They wouldn't wake up one day, you know, there's this great tradition of the picaresque novel. You wake up one day, you pack a small bag and you hit the road, you know? 
women don't do that. It took too long to like find the right coffee mug and, and, you know, hang those shades in the bedroom and everything. They cling to their nest. So eventually I realized that if I wanted to explore that question of identity, of stripped down identity, it would have to be a woman who had to leave her life. And that's what brought me to the idea of Fran Flynn and Bobby Benedetto and her using um, a, a kind of an almost an underground railroad um, to help women who were being um, beaten by their husbands to flee from them. And one of the most heartbreak the most heartbreaking questions I ever got about that book were when women at book signings would sidle up to me and say, can you tell me more about the Underground Railroad? And I would realize that what they thought was that it was a real thing and that I could tell them how to be in touch with it so that they could get out of the situation that they were in. For all I know, such a thing does exist. I have no knowledge of that. Uh, I completely invented the one in the book. You know, I, I think you probably experienced as the Freedomers have, whenever we've done uh, book signings after a presentation, it's always the last two or three people who have that connection. Um, and it's heart-wrenching. It's also very heroic, but they, they linger because in that moment, it's not just about a signature in a book, it's I too have a story. So having done over 20 books, I can imagine those, those last folks in line for every one of your books, there's that storyteller. And, and what do you usually tell that storyteller? Do you encourage them to pick up a pen? Do you encourage them to write what needs to be written? It depends on, on why they've approached me. Um, I've had to say over and over again to the people who run bookstores, who are, by the way, all fantastic people, um, but you know, who are interested in making the event work correctly. And I have to say to them, there are going to be people who stop in this line and give me things or tell me things and they cannot be hurried. Um, and I understand that you want to move the line along and everything, but there are people, if, if somebody is standing in front of me weeping, we cannot hurry her. Um, and sometimes they just want to respond. They want you know, they've read the book, they've had a profound reaction to it, and they want, they want to, to communicate that profound reaction to the person who wrote the book. Um, so, and sometimes they do have a story that they want to tell me. When I was still a columnist, sometimes they had a column that they wanted me to write, and they would give me, you know, some pages or a letter or something like that. But mostly I just listen. Um, because mostly they just want me to be present. Um, it, you know, it's, it's incredibly humbling. I was, I can't remember where I was at an event and a man and a woman came to the table and the man said, we just drove three hours to be here because this is the thing on her bucket list. And I just thought, how? How is, how can I be the thing on the bucket list? But if I'm going to be the thing on the bucket list, boy, I'd better be the best thing on the bucket list that anybody could imagine sitting behind an author's table. And I love your humility about that, because I, I think when, when I met you, unbeknownst to you, you were on my bucket list. And I remember meeting you at a, a screening in New York for our film. And with me was my student, Maria who is the basis of Ava in the film. And we sat a couple rows in front of you and I saw for the entire two hours, not because of the film, but the fact that, that Anna Quinlan was in the theater. I, it just, it was overwhelming to me um, because as, as a, a student of writing and a teacher of writing, um, it, it doesn't get any better for someone like me to be in your presence. Um, and then meeting, you, you always hope that people are normal and gracious and you were all of those things and more. Um, oh, isn't that just, isn't the opposite just the worst? I mean, you know, when, when you do a bookstore signing, they will say to you all the time, very tentatively, will you personalize? And I say, yeah. And they say, and can someone take a picture? And I go, yeah. And I think, 
what kind of person writes a book and puts it out there, which is like, you know, I, I write this and I go, okay, I'm giving you this piece of myself and then says, well, you can have a piece of myself, but I won't <laughs> let you take my picture. I, I don't get that. I mean, I feel like the relationship between writers and readers is very important to both of them. Um, and the writer particularly ought to bring her A game to that. So I'm sure you've traveled all over the world with your books. And so I want to have a, a question about what are your, your favorite independent bookstores? I think it's so important for us to support independent bookstores. Oh, I'm there's so favorite. many good ones. Um, there's um, a, a bookstore that does fantastic events and that I've had great experiences with called Rainy Day Books in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, that's definitely a great one. At a time when everybody was saying, oh, an independent bookstore can't survive, being killed by the chains. Oh, never mind, Amazon. Ann Patchett, the wonderful novelist, oh. opened Parnassus in Nashville, and Parnassus has done fantastically, even during the pandemic, I, I checked in with Ann and said, so how are things? And they were, you know, they have such loyal um, patrons that they were sending people books, mailing people books. So there's that one. Um, there's a place called Book Passage in Corte Madera. Yeah, one of my favorites. Oh. Yeah, really good, right? I mean, and I know I'm I'm leaving some some out. Elliott Bay and Tattered Cover and and oh, there's one. Oh, Wichita Watermark Books. Um, it, oh, in Tulsa, there's a really good one in Tulsa that has that has a really interesting business plan, which is it's basically set up as a nonprofit. You know, everybody kept saying, well, you can't make money with an independent bookstore. And these people said to themselves, well, okay, then we'll set up an independent bookstore that isn't designed on that business model. So I, I, I just think they're fantastic. And, and, you know, one of the great things is those are the people where you come in and say, I loved Ann Patchett's last book what should I read next? And they say, oh, the new Cynthia Sweeney's really good, or you might like this, you know, and, and that, that kind of hand selling of books, there's nothing like it. Absolutely. There's a phenomenal bookstore in Austin, Texas, that, that loves to embrace the keep Austin weird mantra. Um, but book people in Austin is just, it's yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's great, the, I'm telling you, there's great ones all over the country. And, and Patrons really embrace them. You know, you always heard the adage about nurture versus nature, but having three kids who all of them dabble or make their livelihood in, in writing and publishing, how does it feel that they have followed in your footsteps? I know they do many creative things. I mean, your daughter acted and was a comedian, but also proudly states that she's a writer and your sons as well. So how does that feel that all three of your kids have embraced that? Oh, I think it was, was it Matthew Rich, Frank Rich's son? I think I just saw an interview with that totally captured why I think my kids are comfortable with writing. And it's because, I don't want to be flippant about this, but to a certain extent, I made it look doable. So, okay. She gets a cup of coffee every morning and she vanishes upstairs. And two hours later, she comes down and says, oh, my God, oh, it's so terrible. And she gets more coffee and goes back <laughs> upstairs. And I think I, I think I de I think I demystified it in a way that I think lots of parents can demystify um, certain professions for kids. I mean, look, it's no coincidence that a lot of police officers in this country are second, third, fourth generation police officers because they've sat at the dinner table and listened to the stories about how it works to work on the street or doctors or lawyers. And I, I think the same is, is true with writers. I don't think that there's any question of, you know, some, some weird little allele on one of my genes that got passed down to these three that suddenly made them able to string words together. But I think from a very early age, they thought, 
putting words down on the page is something that you can do for a living. And I, I think there probably was a moment, given what a wacky mom I was with my hair on fire, when they thought, if this woman can do it, anyone can do it. But I think of the veracity in which you write. You know, you were always a columnist while you were also writing novels. And I think, you know, some years you had multiple releases. I think one of your most prolific years, I think it was like 1998, you had a nonfiction, a fiction, and a children's book all come out in a singular while you were also a columnist. So how is that possible? Were you just um, inspired? Did you have a muse? Or how is it possible that you can balance so many different storylines all at once? Well, sometimes the books are stacked up like planes in a holding pattern. So you've done one one year, but they're holding it for another year or, or you know, it, it's not often that you're working on the same one at the same time. And 1998 is, is a good year to note because I stopped writing the column for the Times in 1995. I mean, for five years there, I had three young children. I was writing two columns a week and I was trying to finish One True Thing, um, the novel. And at a certain point, I just thought this, uh, to, to paraphrase Yates, the center will not hold. Something needs to give. Um, it's obviously not gonna be the children. Um, and that's why I gave up the Times column. So from 95 to 2000, when I started the Newsweek column, which was only every other week, as opposed to two a week, um, I had this five year interregnum during which I had more time to just do nothing but write and when I, after I pick them up at school, yell at my kids and make them dinner. Mm. Take me to 1992 when you are the third woman, third woman to win the Pulitzer Prize. And I want to read what they, how they uh, acclaimed you. They said it was for her compelling columns on a, a wide range of personal and political topics. So you're at the New York Times, it's 1992. Um, did you know that they threw your hat in the ring? Had they thrown your hat in the ring in other years? And, and what is that like to get the most coveted award for a writer? I had a kind of a tip off because the head of the Pulitzer um, board at that point was a man named Michael Gartner, who was also the president of NBC News. And it just so happened, I, I, I worked almost entirely at home because of the kids, but it just so happened that I was in my office at the Times that day and uh, uh, the Today Show called up and asked me if the next morning I would go on in the first hour. And I'd been on the Today Show a number of times, but I'd never been on in the first hour, which is a much newsier hour. And given the fact that at three o'clock that afternoon, the Pulitzers were going to be announced, the fact that they wanted me on the next morning and that Michael Gartner um, might be in the know sort of made me go, hmm. Um, and look, I mean, it's my telegram is right up there that <laughs> says that I won. Um, and, um, I, I mean, my colleague, Russell Baker, used to say, you always know what the first line of your obituary will say. Um, and it's just thrilling. But, um, you know, some people parlay the Pulitzer into a better job. I already had the best job in journalism. So that wasn't the issue. Here's, here's what I still think of as the best thing about Pulitzer. So at three o'clock, telephone rings, this is Western, this is how, old, how long ago this was. This is Western Union calling from Miss Anna Quinlan. This woman says, says the, the president of Columbia University is pleased to inform you that you have won the, oh my goodness, this is wonderful. I said, <laughs> Thank you very much. Could you finish reading? So she finishes and then she says, we'll send you a copy of the telegram. And I get off the phone and I call my father's house. And his wife answers the phone. And I said, uh, I, I, can I talk to my dad? And she said, he's out driving around in the truck because every 20 minutes news radio says that you won the Pulitzer. <laughs> and that 
was the high point in winning the Pulitzer for me, that my dad was driving around in the truck uh, listening to that. Oh. And next morning when I went on the Today Show, he went with me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. And that, you know, I mean, for, for my father to be able to swan around saying that for the rest of his life, I, that was infinitely more important to me. Family means the world to you. And I, I love that when... My forever family, my my freedom writer teacher family wanted to choose a a forward written by the most significant writer that you were unanimously chosen. And I remember being so nervous reaching out to you to ask if you would do us the honor of, of writing the forward. And because you have a sister who is in our chosen profession, um, right. you you graced us with that opportunity. I, I want to read the paragraph that always makes me cry because I kid you not, Anna, you just make me cry. As I said earlier, my, my Vivaldi. Um, it's the last paragraph of the forward. And what you do throughout the forward is pay such homage to such a difficult profession. And in Teaching Hope, it was 150 teachers from every state in America and several provinces of Canada. But Based on our, for- you had read every single word, you had validated them, you evoked them in your forward. But I just, I want to read this because I want, I want our listeners who may not be familiar with your work to become familiar with your work. You said, and so I stick with my blanket statement. Earlier, you had talked about teachers having the most difficult job. It's the toughest job there is, and maybe the most satisfying too. There are lives lost in this book, and their lives saved too. If salvation means a young man or woman begins to feel deserving of a place on the planet, quote, everyone knows I'm going to fail, says one boy, and then he doesn't. What could be more soul satisfying? These are the most influential professionals most of us will ever meet. The effects of their work will last forever. Each one here has a story to tell, each different. But if there is one sentiment, one sentence that appears over and over again, it is the simple declaration, I am a teacher. They say it with dedication and pride and well they should. On behalf of all students, current, former and those to come, let me echo with a sentiment of my own. Thank you for what you do. And so I weep every time I read that aloud um, because you honor a profession that is so hard where my brethren and your sister are overworked and underpaid and to have that validation from someone who gets us and gets it and has a Pulitzer Prize behind it um, was the greatest moment for me opening up that book and reading that aloud. And I thank you for that. Well, I will go out on a limb and say that even though it doesn't get reflected enough in public um, or even in private, I would imagine that almost every person in America has a story like that Mm -hmm. of a teacher who, who brought them along. Mm. You know, there's a question I want to ask you that I was so thankful in your, in your Newsweek column that you covered it. I had reached out to you after one of our Freedom Rider teachers featured in this book um, lost her job because she had bought the Freedom Riders uh, diary and passed it out in Meridian, Indiana. And you wrote a story about that in your column. And it really hearkened to what is a banned book? and what is censorship? So as a prolific writer, I wanna pose that question to you. What is a banned book and what is censorship to you? I I don't think there should be such a thing as a banned book. Um, And and I know that we're hypersensitive now about content that people find destabilizing. We have trigger warnings that we didn't have at the time that I was writing that column, for example. Um, But I think that we, underestimate what reading can do for people when we suggest that facing your worst fears in the pages of a book 
will by definition be unacceptable. I think over and over again, people have faced their worst fears in the pages of a book and found them neutered in a way that made them less fearful, less challenging. Um, I, I also don't think, again and again, and during Banned Books Week, young people are sold short. You know, will young people who read about witchcraft in the Crucible or in Harry Potter become Satanists? Will young people who read about sexual situations become sexually active? We're, we're so, we so talk down to younger people as though we were never young ourselves or as though we think the worst of the young people we once were. Um, I think everybody should be able to read everything and decide for themselves whether it's good or bad, um, whether it has meaning for their life um, or whether it has meaning that leads them in a different direction. Um, uh, I think untrammeled reading is the best thing we can do. The Freedom Writers are starting a new book project and they've, they've passed the baton to 50 young student authors. And it's gonna be a, a cry for help, a, a letter written by the youth. And the Freedom Writers and the Freedom Art teachers are gonna help them with a solution. Um, hopefully they're on the other side of that scenario. So for those 50 young authors who have had trauma, who are writing their narrative and, and shining the spotlight on their truth, what would your advice for them be? They're, they're eager and excited and also nervous. So what, what would you encourage them to do as this process begins? You know, the most sort of flippant response I always get when people ask about writing is put your butt in a chair. People spend a lot of time thinking about writing and talking about writing. And no, writing gets done by putting your butt in a chair and putting words on the page. Um, but I would also tell them that they're going to have to make their peace with going deep. There's a Robert Frost quote, no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. Ooh. And it, it applies to a lot of things. So no honesty or empathy in the writer, no honest empathetic response in the reader. If, if you want them not only to feel your truth, but to connect it to their own, you have to go deep. I would refer mm -hmm. back as I did at the beginning to that young freedom writer who said, I don't necessarily want to tell this story or read it over and over again, but I do it to make that connection. And it's that connection that they're going to have to go for. They're going to, you, you sit, you sit with the copy book or you sit with the laptop or the phone and you think there's somebody right there and they're waiting for me to validate their life. Mm. You, you wrote it so beautifully in your book, how writing, how reading it changed my life. Um, so for these young authors, if they have discovered you and they were to pick up a book to read, to become better writers of all of your books, then there's so many, is there one or two that you would recommend for these young authors to read in your incredible bookshelf um, that can help them be, be better writers? Well, so much depends on, on what kind of people they are to begin with. As we all know, there are certain people who are intuitively drawn to novels, to stories. And there are others who like that idea of nonfiction that's grounded um, in the world. Um, but the book that younger people seem to respond to um, very viscerally is the shortest book I've ever written. It's called A Short Guide to a Happy Life. That was based um, on your speech. Is that yeah, correct? It was, based that? On a, it was based on a commencement speech I gave. And over and over again, um, high school students and college students have told me that, that they felt guided by it in a way that, that 
is really moving for me. So for students who love nonfiction, um, we'll recommend that. But for students who love fiction, what would you recommend? I think the book that I've written that shows the deepest understanding of younger people is a very difficult novel to um, read at some level. It's called Every Last One. Um, and, and this, I would say, four of the central characters in it are teenagers. Um, but it's, it, it's a book that understands what it's like to be young and how hard it can be. So for every book club around the globe, for our audience, there's a book that you are working on now. And when can we read it? And what can we anticipate from this next book project that is imminent? Well, I'm, I'm working on a book about writing, but writing for, as I say, civilians, um, a, a, a clarion call for all of us to write as opposed to losing our words, our thoughts, our observation in a reign of computer code, which is what we're doing right now. Um, I'm working on the revisions right now, so I don't know how soon um, there'll actually be a book, but I would imagine it'll be sometime in the next 12 months or so. My last question for you is, as an author and an activist and, and just a general advocate of, of the written word, uh, I love that you still believe in pen and paper, um, writing letters to folks over than just an email or the telephone. So could you talk about why not losing that art form is so important for you that we don't lose that connection to a pen, to a piece of paper and just the art of writing? Because those are actual physical things. Um, I think of my children coming up to this desk where I work um, the day after I've died. Conceivably, they could sift through endless documents on my computer, you know, to see if there are essays or half finished pieces or, or communications that they want and treasure. Or they could do something much more simple, elegant and timeless. They could open this drawer and there could be a letter sitting here. And it, it, you know, we tend to think that when a new form comes along, it needs to edge out the old one. I mean, when paperback books first came out, there were all kinds of pieces about how hardcovers were over. Why would anybody pay $25 for a hardcover when you could get a paperback for 14 bucks. But we now know that some people like hardcover books and some people like paperback books and some people like digital books. And I don't think that, that the instant communication that we have with texts and emails and Instagram posts should edge out the personal letter, um, which not only is timeless, but also is personal in a different way. I mean, if you read my emails, they're set in the font that I've sent my emails in, Times New Roman. If you look at my letter, it's written in my handwriting. So that when you look at my letter, to a certain extent, what it says is, Anna was here. And I think there's a value to that, particularly for the people that we love and may live, leave behind that electronic communication just can't match. I think I'm gonna give our audience a homework assignment in your honor. I think I'm gonna ask everyone listening to this podcast to pick up a pen and to declare that they were here and, and write a letter. Um, and that letter could be to their favorite teacher, maybe their favorite author, which is you, or to someone who shaped their life. I, I think that would be a great testament to you and your love of words. and. I think that would be an amazing ripple effect to see uh, if everyone around the globe just picked up a pen and wrote a letter. Anna, you are my moonshot. You are my North Star. Um, when I think about you, I, I can't think of enough adjectives and adverbs because you are all that is good and right and pure. And I'm just so honored that our audience gets to have a taste of my love affair with you. And I hope that they are inspired to write and to read. And then most importantly, 
do it for themselves. I think that's what you do so beautifully is you encourage others to follow in your footsteps and you have blazed quite a trail. And so I thank you for, for doing that for all of us who are now walking on that trail that you've blazed. I thank you and I honor you and I can't wait to read your next book. Well, thanks Erin and thanks for everything that you've done for writing.